Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another enlightening episode of Collaboration Over Competition, a podcast that dives deep into the incredible outcomes that arise when collaboration takes center stage. I am your host, Frederick Freeman Jr., and today's episode promises to be nothing short of inspiring. Now, today, man, it is with honor, it is with honor that I welcome my next guest on the platform, a legendary multi talented actor, comedian, entrepreneur, rapper, writer, producer, Omar Gooding, aka yes, Big O. How you doing today, man? I'm blessed and highly favored. Yourself? Man, I have blessed and can't complain as well, man. It's it's an honor to have you on the show today, my man, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time out your busy schedule for us to sit here and have this elevated conversation. No problem. Let's get it. All righty. Now, uh, you know, as, as we kick off our conversation today, uh, you know, I like to delve into a fundamental question that kind of sets the tone for this discussion. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm wondering, what does the idea of collaboration over competition represent to you? And do you have any advice on how we can encourage others to come together to collaborate more? Um, well, you know, I mean, that's actually a, that's that's a that's a big deal, especially in our community, especially with the industries that I uh, I would say dabble in. I'm, I'm really knee deep in all of them. Yeah. Um, collaborating with one to one another, man. We help each other. We pull each other up. We overcome the stigma of uh, crabs in a barrel. Yes. Um, you know, it's an age long question. Why don't we help each other more? Collaborate, um, expand. Uh, you know, we're better, stronger together than apart. But everybody always wants to prove something like I can do it on my own. Uh, I don't need any help. When the truth is you go much farther as a unit than you will individually. Um, a lot of the great people, individuals that we all know and look up to have a team around them. That's nice. collaboration. You know, it takes a village. All of these these cliche adages, they work and they apply if you apply them and nice. you go uh, a lot farther as a team. So we must collaborate. Yes. No, I, I love that. Uh, you know what I kind of take from that? You know, we got to we got to uh, practice what we preach, you know, that part. S- especially in our community. We talk about a lot. So, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I created this platform, you know, not just to talk yeah. about it, but, you know, uh, show different ways, show people different ways to collaborate, you know, giving them examples. You know, some people want to but don't know how. Uh, yeah. You know, once you know how, you know, it's time to put in the work. So, you know, pra- practice what you preach. And I definitely I definitely love that that feedback. Um, so kind of stand on the topic of collaboration. I wonder, like, how do you see collaboration contributing to your various endeavors, whether that be comedy, business, music? You know, I'm sure, you know, just a one man army. I'm wondering, like, how does collaboration contribute to, you know, your success and your endeavors? Yeah, exactly. So uh, as an actor, we'll start there. Um, you have to have a team. You have to have a team, you know, uh, you have to have access to the various projects that are available when you're first starting out. It's all about auditioning. Now, when you're auditioning, it's preparation. Yep. It's an in preparation comes not only knowing the material, but looking the part um, in knowing the material. You may need somebody that can read and is knowledgeable of um, theater in the sense of being able to read a scene with you and give you uh, just enough for you to achieve what you need to achieve to land the part. Um, Memorization, of course, is key. Somebody to run lines with you. Um, And then you go with looking the part. You know, people that are knowledgeable in whatever field that it is that you are trying to portray, if be it a doctor, you got to get that right look. Um, Maybe he's just a a fashionable dude, so you need somebody that knows fashion that helps you, you know, put your your, your fit together and then your accessories and a little bit of things that help you really delve into the character a little bit more. Be it glasses, maybe it's a cigar, maybe it's a pencil, maybe it's, you know, they could be, you could be pantomiming these things, but there's something about accessories that helps you um, really get into the part. There's a lot of roles that I've done that were enhanced once I got into the costume so to speak yeah. be it a period piece be it a gangster role whatever it is you know so there's that um and then there's the business side of it you got to have a lawyer you got to have somebody knowledgeable of contracts so that you uh get what you deserve and do not um you know uh find out later that there's a loophole or a stipulation to something that you didn't read the fine print about you know what i mean so that's just there all the way to the music business which is all of what I said, but magnified by 10 and also um, politics of it all. You know, every single industry has some form of politics that you have to overcome, be it the click mentality where people kind of stay together and it kind of goes back with the collaboration. They collaborate amongst themselves, but they don't let anybody else in. Um, And then with stand-up comedy, it's the same thing, Um, but more so 
you need to collaborate with other comics and people of talent uh, comically uh, to go over your jokes. Maybe, um, you know, sometimes they help refine because, you know, you can tell a joke and be like, that's funny. Another person said, but you should have said this is a punchline rather than that. And you're like, ah, oh, that's even better. You know what I mean? You, you, you practice your craft by not only telling jokes around people when you're comfortable, but when you're uncomfortable. Yes. You know, uh, how can I command this room full of people that don't know me or may not be familiar with me or may not be in the mood to laugh just now? So uh, 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 the preparation of collaborating with others and trying the material there, you know what I mean? And then yes. moving on to a, a place where you're going to try out the new material, but also with some proven material because you collaborated with others to make sure that it's out. Yeah. No, I, I love that. You know, it kind of shows how just collaboration is a major part, major part in all your success and everything that you do. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. You, you can't can't be great alone. So I definitely love how you showcase that, you know, in all endeavors of your uh, that you work in. So uh, to move on to some entertainment questions, uh, I'm wondering, yeah. what would you say is your most cherished film role that you've had the opportunity to portray? Cherished film role. Um, but that has to be Baby Boy, just because of so many levels. Not only his... Uh, our, our late great John Singleton passed away and there's a legacy that he's left for us, but yes. it, so many, um, different relationships were made good and bad through that, from that film, um, and continue develop to develop because of that film. Yes. So, uh, yeah, hands down easily. Okay. Uh, so for my next one, I'm wondering, could you share with us your favorite TV show series that you had to part the privilege of being part of? Uh, honestly, my favorite isn't my most longest running. The longest running was, um, 91 episodes of family time, which was, uh, which was fun to work on, but my favorite had to be smart guy. It was just a time in my life, um, where I was coming to coming into my own as a man. Uh, and the writing was just effortless. It was, it never needed to be tweaked or altered. I didn't have to find a new punchline. The writing on that, shout out to Jeff and the, oh, the whole team, the staff was brilliant. They were brilliant at writing for all of us, you know? Yeah. So um, the cast was great, obviously. I mean, I'm when I say obviously, I mean, as, as far as not only where I, did I have personal relationships with everyone there, no problems or beef, <laughs> you know, no behind the scenes drama with any of them. Um, and we truly love being around each other, man. It was a fun time in my life. That's awesome. You know, I heard in a recent interview that you've been in over 400 TV episodes. So, you know, to finally get your favorite, you know, I definitely think <laughs> like that. that yeah. right uh, so throughout your career, you know, you've collaborated with numerous talented individuals. Uh, is there a standout actor that, you know, who particularly impressed you or inspired you along the way? Uh, sure. There are a lot. There are a, a whole lot. Um, and I'm sure after this, I'll go, oh, I should have mentioned him. But the one when you said that, that just popped in my mind. And uh, this is fun. This goes to collaboration very strongly. Miguel Nunez Jr. Right. Mm -hmm. We did a film called uh, Christmas in Compton. And uh, I was the lead. And he was really the funny man in the movie. You know what I mean? Even though I do comedy and I, you know. At the time, it was like stand-up comedy. It was my audition. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was go in a room and just kill. And uh, they booked me as the lead. But then as the lead, you know, when you're a lead in a film, no matter what the genre is, you kind of have to take uh, a journey. You don't just start here and in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's times when I have to just be the lead and I have to be compassionate. I have to, you know, pull my other actors around me. And there's other times where I'm standing alone and I can just kind of, you know, do my thing. So uh, the fun thing, especially um, this kind of plays with the other show that I did. I did it. I, I mentioned it um, briefly. Uh, uh, family time where being the lead on the show was fun because I knew in certain scenes I would be the guy. I would be the funny man. I'd have to drive it. In other scenes, I can fall back when there's a funnier or a, a guy that's who's just a ball of energy, who's just pure comedy. I could just yeah. fall back and just make comments. That was Miguel, but times 10. Like he was awesome at all times and the coolest thing about with him he's very uh unselfish he loves everybody to be great so he would give other people advice without trying to be bossy or take over anything he would hear yes. someone saying a line and said mm, you should try this and he went oh man that is funny i'll try that you know and he, he would do it every with everybody he said oh that's real good that's funny stuff you're doing but you could say this too we'd be like oh i didn't even think about that yeah i'm gonna try that i'm gonna try that you know um 
he was just such a giver. And I was just like, man, I love working with Miguel. And I think we worked on two or three projects together now. Uh, but that was the first time. And it helped me because, like I said, I was like, okay, I just got to focus on this. I'm, you know, I'm keeping the glue. I got to remember the storyline. So I'm going to, you know, uh, I got to do this in this scene. Well, he gets to just go balls out. You know what I mean? I'm like, it's great. I know I can relax when he's in the scenes. I know he's going to take care of it. And if I'm too busy kind of focusing on being the lead, he can say, yo, bro, why don't you try this? I know you ain't, your funny ain't turned on for this because you think it's a deep scene, but why don't you try this one? I'm like, mm, I am going to do that. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah. uh, he was truly an asset no, and I, fun I to work with, that. man. Uh, yeah, the actors. Sounds like y'all had good chemistry and how you describe him, you know, it kind of sounds like a. I'm sorry, a, a good, start over again? No, I was saying, uh, I love how you described him, you know, the the way you described him, it sounds like, you know, he's a person, you know, uh, a person you look for in a collaboration, open-minded, you yeah. know, willing to communicate with others. So, uh, no, I, I definitely love that. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I know you worked with a bunch of talented individuals, so that's yeah. interesting, you know, to hear that perspective. Now, well, I mean, it's funny. Follow- some guys, you know, I was like this for a while, too, where I would just kind of be in a bubble where I would say, look, I know what my job is. I got to lock in. I got to do me. And people say things like, you want to run lines? I'd be like, not really, <laughs> because it just, it, it doesn't help me. In memorization, I just needed quiet. I needed to just focus and da 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 da. And that's selfish. You know, that is selfish. Sometimes actors need it. It's not, do you want to run lines? No, I'm fine. But if you want to run lines, I'll run it with you. You know what I mean? Don't say that. Just do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I'm, I'm sorry. But go ahead. No, uh, I know you said you had a lot of names that come to mind. So, this is kind of like my follow up question. So, as an actor, I'm wondering uh, who would you say are your top five actors of all time? Uh, just my top five, just that I, oh man, 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 man. Um, I always start with Denzel cause I think, you know, he's flawless and he's never let me down. Um, Viola Davis. I love her too. Um, goodness. Oh, that's a deep one. That's a tough too. I love Al Pacino cause I respect some, so much of his body of work and his versatility as well. You know, like I love Godfather where he starts one way and ends the other, like not many, actors do that like when you get to see the evolution on screen like yeah he's just a regular you know he's a good old boy and by the end you're like no he's a gangster (laughs) could you imagine watching baby boy and at the beginning i start off as mo from smart guy and by the end of the credits i'm dumb sweet pea choking like that would have been you know what i mean which is phenomenal and scarface and and, you know things of that nature um but yeah i respect people who really get down man because as an actor, I'm an actor who knows his lane and I know what roles I can really kill. So I pick and choose accordingly for my fans and for myself to do the role justice. But there's other actors like my brother who's up in there as well because yes. he can do any damn thing. He doesn't need like, well, it's not really me. Me or not, he could pull it off. and He's yeah, going to pull yeah, it yeah. off. Well, I mean, from radio to Boys in the Hood to Na- the Navy Diver. Like, come on, man. Men of Honor was yeah. insane, you know, so... Um, actors like that, really, like I worked with Holly Berry once and, uh, it was an intense scene where I played an orderly and I was supposed to be, uh, you know, physically moving her, uh, out of the scene. And when we rehearsed it, she kept breaking free and I was like, I'm gonna have to really snatch her up. She's not acting, you know? And, uh, I told the other orderly, you grab her. <laughs> I would just point at where to go, you know? And then the next day on set, it was funny because they had to shuttle us to the location from the trailers and, uh, you know, our dress rooms and whatnot. And uh, I remember while we were riding over, she turned around. She's like, yeah, you bruised me up yesterday. Look at these. I was like, that wasn't me. Remember, it was the other dude. She started laughing, but she was like, no, but I am serious, though. And her arms were black and blue. I'm like, that was all you, Catwoman. Did nobody tell you? To you yeah, know? don't play with Holly. But you never know. When they say action, when you see people that are just so fun to talk to, and then action, that light turns on, and then you're just in the moment. Like, you can't help but be great because how great they are. Those are, yes, I think that was about five, but. um, Yes. I no, I, I feel like the names you pointed out, man, definitely speak to, you know, the type of actor you are as well, being honored, you know, to have worked with these people. So right. uh, great list, and I love it. So on, on to my next one. So as a comedian, as a comedian yourself, mm-hmm. I'm wondering, could you share, uh, you know, your top five list of comedians who have maybe less, left the lasting impression on you? Hmm, that's fun. Uh so for me at the top is uh, Dave Chappelle. Um, so impressed, man. And I'm watching his journey as a human, and it really, really fascinates me. You start with, um, what was it, Killing Him Softly? That that whole piece, just, it, it was daunting. It was intimidating as an ins- aspiring stand-up comic. I was I watched that, and I'm like, oh, no, that's impossible. He's an alien. There's no way. I don't see how people 
do that. You just stand up there with this like monologue memorized that you can interchange parts depending on the crowd and just remember every punchline. How in the hell is it done? And then I fast flash forward to now where I know now it's insane. And yeah. to know that he knew that then <laughs> was yeah. insane. And then he was on top of the world with the number one show in the world. Everybody wanted a part of it. Everyone a piece of it. Then he got tempted by that 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 temptation, you know. And he said, "No, I'm out of here." You know what I mean? I'm 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 gonna keep my integrity. I'm not gonna compromise. Deuces, y'all say what y'all want. He's crazy. He's this. He's that. And then reinvent yourself and come right back on top again, Even bro. Even bigger. Even and bigger. you know, and when I watch now, he uses his platform to say things, to make points, to try to create change. He's not perfect. You know, there's some things I'm like, ah, I wish you would have avoided that. But he still um, evolved. He reinvented. Yes. And now he's sitting at a place where, you know, when he starts doing comedy, and he's, he's somewhere. You want to be there. You want to listen. It may just be him uh, making a point that's very valid. It may be him trying to save the world in his own way. And it may be him just making you yep. laugh. So yep. um, I start there. Then I remember people like uh, Eddie Murphy and Bill Cosby mm-hmm. who were master storytellers, master storytellers. And and I put them in the same breath because they're at two ends of the spectrum and they were not shy to tell, I say they, like they're gone, but they're, you know, thank God they're, they're, they're still with us. And they both um, would let you know, I'm doing it this way and you're doing this way. And it's funny as it, it ties into my journey. So I have done a lot of comedy from 47 years old. I started when I was nine I had a uh, TV show, regular series, uh, regular series TV show called um, Wild and Crazy Kids from 12 to 15. And then I started really doing comedy um, for a sitcom, Hang With Mr. Cooper. And that ran five years. We did 100 episodes. Then it rolls into Smart Guy. And it was that's when my comedy stepped up a bit, right? Yeah. Um, so I would do interviews and I would do live interviews on television. Um, I knew how to be funny while not cursing, right? However, if you knew me away from when the cameras are rolling, you know, all the gloves are off. <laughs> I worked with Mark Curry, who's also up there with uh, in that category, because he showed me comic timing, mm. showed me how to handle myself as a businessman when I got into some trouble in the streets. Um, how to rebound from that before my career was damaged. But I also saw him do clean comedy on air and then go see him perform live and go, oh my God, this is a whole different person, right? So back to my my, my 1A and Bs, or my 2A and Bs, um, which would be Bill and Eddie. Bill Cosby showed you clean without, just effortlessly. You, you didn't even realize he hadn't cursed. You're just watching this going, that was funny and memorable. And he created characters and where they were real or not or whatever. He just takes you on a journey every single time. Eddie Murphy did the same thing, but all but but flourished in the profanity and the profane. He made it so you're going, oh shit, turn it down. Did mom hear me listen to this? It's like and it took you on this another journey with all those same things, but completely vulgar. Like he refused not to say <laughs> to be clean, yeah. you know. And then the funny thing with my journey, I just did my first headlining job in uh, Virginia. At a Dave and Buster's, and it was a, co- a clean quality show. Uh, shout out to Quincy on Bar. That. And when I was first offered it, I was like, "Damn, how am I going to do this?" Because my stand-up comedy um, before this was closer to Eddie Murphy than, <laughs> than it was Bill Cosby. Just because the things that I talk about right now, and especially at my age, um, I'm not pulling no punches, you know. And it's yeah. it's a lot about. Uh, my experiences, which is what captivates my audience. People are like, oh, he's he's not just up there writing random jokes about random things. No, he's talking about himself. He mentions his brother, his mother, his father, his sister, his wife, his kids. He talks about being an actor in the streets and being recognized and how people respond to him. And tell, you know, so these people are like, oh, my God. And then it's it's also funny, you know. So when they said, can you do it clean? I was like, Damn. <laughs> How do I talk about everything and then be clean? Ah, I see. And it wasn't as hard as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. It wasn't difficult at all. 
I didn't go, oops, I didn't mean to say that. I'm sorry, sorry this was a clean show. That never happened once, which was funny because the, the comic that got on before me messed up several times. And then the host got up there and said, I told y'all to keep it clean. I don't know what he was thinking, you know. And for me, it was, it was just like, boom, this is where we're at. Let's flip this switch. So it's been fascinating to be able to learn and to draw from them. Um, you know, a friend of mine, when I said it too, because when I first started doing stand-up, I would, you know, I'd record everything and I'd watch it. And when I watched it back, I'm like, you know, everybody's going, no, man, you were hilarious. And I was like, yeah, but why am I talking so fast? Why am I rushing through jokes and then rush to the next joke? And don't even let them laugh. I just rush to the next joke. And then, while they're giggling a little bit, oh, and another thing. And they're like, bro, take a breath. Bring some water on stage. Take a sip. Think for a moment. Let it breathe. Yeah. Don't be afraid for it to be quiet. Like, I'm learning all of those things. And then my, own, my other problem I had was I cursed a lot. Where I got nervous. My nerves started going. I was saying, fuck it, motherfuckers. I just kept falling out my mouth. So I'm watching it back like, God, do I know any other words? Like, you know. So once I, when I, again, when they said, can you do clean? I was just like, oh, man, I got to work on it. Then I had a few months to kind of fine tune uh, my show and just make sure I could. Um, and, uh, you know, and I did a big performance. I did a couple of big performances in L.A., which were fun. And I say big to me. There were two that kind of solidified it for me. One, I was fasting. So I didn't have any alcohol or any, any, you know, a little smoke, something, nothing. I was completely clean. And I was like, oh, man, I wonder if I could still be funny. And it was like, oh, it was it, beyond. Everybody was like, my God, you, what are you doing backstage? <laughs> Drinking water? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and that was dope for me because I rocked it. And it was a hosting job, which was funny, too, because they had like, like a crowd warm up guy who was terrible. And I'm like, is he out there? And it's like, yeah, he's out there. It's what I'm hearing he laughter. So I'd go out there and I'm like, I really got to bring it because the crowd is dead looking like, what is going on here? And, um, and I, I, I achieved it, you know, pat myself on the back. But it was a fun time. And then the other one, uh, I hosted uh, a comedy awards um, for, and, and it was like all of black Hollywood com- comedians. It was awesome. You know, we, we presented... Um, who do we present? We spread oh, out Bentley Kyle Evans, of course. We gave him an award. We gave D.L. Hughley an award. Um, mm-hmm. My man Michael Collier was there. All oh, the list goes on and on. I shouldn't even start listing names. I'd be like, you know who you left out? Like, everybody was there. And I was the host of that. And that actually led to a couple of uh, headlining jobs, which was funny. It's like, you just saw me hosting. You want me to headline? Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a fun, fun journey. Did I answer your question in a real quick, short, to the point, Ann? No, I love the stories. <laughs> I'm not already. objecting to them or nothing. You gave me uh, your one, then your two A, two B. You got a three, four, and five to finish it off. Yeah, yeah. So what we did? We said, um, we said Chappelle. We said that we got A, B, and then no, and then Mark Curry is in there. Okay. Um, and then uh, and then oh, so my five is my five because I believe he's changed the game, and that would be Cat Williams. There we his go. His tell all, his bomb drop. Um, the dopest thing about it. The publicity he gave himself was so good that I even went, damn, he's done how many specials? Let me see this. Let me because I think I've seen them all. <laughs> That's what I thought. And as soon as I Googled and his name popped right up and I saw it when I started watching, I said, oh, man. And it was dope to watch it. And it was from, I think, 08 because uh, he was talking a lot about um, Obama and this and that. And the third. So I was just like, oh, wow, this is good. And it's not only good, but. From a now stand-up comedian, I'm just soaking up game. I'm seeing what he does when he goes to different cities and how he, you know, acclimates himself with the town. So we get on stage and talk about that. for. And I had been instinctively doing that, not knowing, like, that's what you do. You know what I mean? And he just, he made it look effortless. And it was great, man. Um, so he's definitely up there because uh, for me, too, I've, I've decided to take my first special because I'm going, why waste material? I've been doing this for like two years on the road. I've got my set is about an hour and a half long, and I just pick which pieces I want to do every time I go on stage. So I'm like, why don't I just empty the tanks, and then I can write more and then do another one later. So uh, in uh, Single to Mile weekend, I'm going to be out in Atlanta at the Atlanta Comedy Corner, and uh, I'm going to take my first special uh, because we have five shows. So I kind of came up with this idea. I was like, well, if I got five shows, we're doing two shows a night, two shows a night, and then one one big show on the uh, on Sunday, I'm like, well, Saturday, I'm going to just wear the same outfit twice, bring a camera crew, and let's just get it. Plus, I'll have them follow me around while I'm out there in Atlanta anyway. So I'm like, oh, that's a special. Might as well. And then we'll put yeah. it together, shoot it yourself, and then go from there. 
Yeah, no, I, I definitely wish you the best on that, and that, that's Thanks, an sir. amazing top five. No, I was wondering, uh, I had that as a, bo- I had this as a bonus, qu- bonus question, but I was wondering, you know, as being a comedian, what did you think of the Cat Williams interview on Club Shay Shay? Yeah. You know, yeah. what'd, you, what'd you think of it? Yeah, so, you know, the funny thing about it, everybody claims to have this superpower. The ability to know when someone's lying. Everyone claim like, oh, I could tell he was lying. I could tell he was lying. Everybody claims to have it, but I don't know who has it or not. Me, personally, I feel like, <laughs> and it's not it's not just everybody. Like, okay, someone walk up and tell me, like, okay, fine. But if you watch somebody who's, like, talking about something, you could, you just, you, the way they say it, how they hold themselves. And, and for me, you know, again, it's easy to say now. But when I finished watching it, and which which was phenomenal to me that I made it through two hours and 44 minutes, I'm like, I can't believe. I mean, I ain't going to lie. It took me about four days. Because yeah. I watched the piece and was like, oh, shoot. And then something else would happen, da 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 But I, remember I kept picking up right where I left off. I said, I'm watching all of this. And when I got to the end of it, I felt like he was at about 75 80% true. That's what I felt. Um, after, you know, living with it and hearing different comments and feedback and talking to different people about it and know, that know him, because I don't know him personally, um, I'm at about 85, 90 now. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. I mean, the one 10% was just, is just again. <laughs> you know, there was some stuff in there. You were just like, really? Yeah. You flew it at three and read uh, four million books at two. Like, you know, there's a little bit of stuff. You kind of, <laughs> okay, fine. But um, I thought it was interesting how connected I was to not know this man. And then he would talk about certain things like Steve Harvey, who I have met a few times mainly because my friend Merlin Santana was killed um, and he was one of the the leads on that show. And we were very close and we're in to like, we got in a bunch of situations that luckily didn't make the news. And this was for uh, before social media, it would have been all over the place. But um, sadly, the way he passed away, you know, it's kind of how he lived. And it was, it was, it was one of those things where, you know, we were in the streets together and I saw, and I just, uh, I tried to big brother him a lot because he came from New York. And when he came out here to L.A., he would ask me questions. You know, he was on Hang With Mr. Cooper with me. And uh, then he was like, yo, I got this Steve Harvey show. And you think it's going to go? I'm like, yeah, man, this Steve Harvey's funny. Why not? You know, you're going to kill. You're going to kill. And it ran and it ran and it ran his course. And then he would listen and then, he, you know, kind of do his own thing. And I just, me, I don't do a lot of preaching. You know, I do, you know, unless you ask me to talk about something. But it's like. I can lead by example. I can give you my advice. And if you're not going to listen, we got to go this way, you know. Yeah. And then I feel bad because it's like, damn, you should have kept him close. And maybe you could have kept trying to steer him. But, or I would have been in that shootout with him. And then, you know, you never know. So anyway, so when he was talking about how he kind of stole Mark Curry's whole idea. And I went, damn, Mark Curry. And that's my guy. That's the guy that I learned a lot of comedic timing from. A lot of games soaked up. I touched on this earlier. I got into it. I had, you know, some guns in the car. I got arrested, blah, 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 blah. And um, Warner Brothers and the whole show, they was ready to kick me off. And Mark took me under wing, invited me to his house, and, was, and just broke it down to, listen, don't go in there with your head down, ignoring it, talk about some no comment. Comment. Stand up for yourself. Walk in, ask everybody's attention, and then, it, uh, first of all, apologize for the embarrassment, if nothing else. And 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 let them know that you're sincere and it should have never happened again. That was in ninety something, and it never happened again. You understand yeah. me? So it it I don't even think how close I, I knew how close I was to losing my job and my career ending before it even started. Um, I have to think back on it, and be like, damn, yeah, that's true. And to see everyone's face go, oh, thank God he said something, and then come and hug me, and this, and I was like, damn, this was wow, you know. And it was genuine, it was sincere, and it and it, and it did save my career. But again. Um, listening to that interview and he, how you talked about how Mark Curry helped write this and write that. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was dope with me too. He didn't necessarily give me jokes. He led by example. So when I saw, I'd read the script and then we'd be at the table read and he would say other things that weren't in the script. And I was like, oh, you could do that, you know, and then watch him do scenes and then do alternate versions and put his own jokes in there. I'm going, wow, that's not in the page, but I got to I gotta go with it. Shit, I'm going to try one at the next rehearsal and see if mine gets put in the script. You know, now I know that you can add, that you can do that. And that's the funnest part. When you get a script, you go home, you make your little changes, you try stuff. And then when you're on the floor, you do this, you give it to them their way. Next time you try something new and people laugh. And next thing you know, you look at the next draft of the script and your joke is written in there. That's big. That's strong. You know what I mean? So... Um, 
once again, learned a lot from Mark Curry. Um, and then, you know, when he talked about the Steve Harvey thing, it was interesting to me because in my opinion, it's it's kind of tough. That's kind of a stretch to me because, I mean, it wasn't like he gave him the idea and he went and made his own show and he never made his show. I mean, he just copied a show that, you know, was successful. It's, you know, nothing happened. That show, man, it was good. We made it all the way to 101 episodes, you know, and then I, I'm not sure how Steve Harvey went, but I'm sure it went to syndication as well. Um, but it was just interesting that it was like, damn, as he's touching on, as he's talking about this stuff, I'm sitting there acting like just a fan that's listening. And I'm like, oh, shit, that's me almost. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm, you know, and then I'm watching him kind of paint the picture of situations that happen. I, you know, it's funny. I was thinking, <laughs> thinking about this the other day, too, about that Cat Williams interview. I was like, yeah, I've been in a lot of rooms, too. And I got receipts as well. Problem is, I drink when I go out and then forget half the shit that happened. So that, none of them receipts are valid. But tell me about this. I'll be like, I don't remember. I don't. I can't testify. I can't do nothing. <laughs> Did you see? I don't know. I hung out with Puffy in London. Uh, what happened? I remember we were in a lobby together. Uh, the next morning, the funny thing is, the next morning he was there. And his bodyguard walked up to me and looked over at me all crazy. And me and my cousin were standing there looking at him like, you all right, bro? He was like, you don't remember me, huh? And I was like, <laughs> you're kind of hard to forget. But you Puffy's bodyguard, right? He's like, yeah. He said, man, y'all need to calm down on the drinking because y'all was acting real crazy yesterday. Y'all was, you know, we about to do something, y'all. And I was like, oh, my bad. He's like, yeah, y'all cool. Come on, hang out with us. And we all out. We had a ball. You know, it was all um, in the lobby. <laughs> with cameras and witnesses, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's nothing private. We didn't go there right. and come up to the room later. We didn't do that. But, uh, but it was fun, you know. And this was, I mean, this was forever ago. This was right after we had finished uh, Smart Guy, too. So yeah, it, it is. It, poor it, baby boy. Was that, <laughs> that whole conversation would probably have been different. Yeah, it, uh, it is crazy to kind of see everything he, he's going through. Uh, I know mm-hmm. you said you haven't met uh, Cat Williams, but I feel like that would be a dope collaboration to see, you know, y'all work together as comedians. Hell yeah, uh, man! And, and, and maybe you know, with your continued success, you know, you, you get you get, you get on that club, Shay Shay, you know, and yeah, you know, and tell it all. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> My club Shay Shay interview would just be funny as hell, man. I just, I just, I don't, I don't hold anger and animosity towards people. I've I've told some stories. I told, I've done enough interviews about you know the Tyrese and the Ving Rain thing and all that stuff. And it was some some of it got misconstrued because they thought that I had a problem with Ving Rain. I never had a problem with Ving Rain. It's just that we had we were in the heat of the moment. We started this wrestling thing, and it was like, hey, I, hey, baby, you know, oh, acting, we acting, we acting. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then with Tyrese, it was just man-to-man type of thing, head button, but we smoothed it over, and we, we're good to this day, you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, my interview would be a little bit different. It wouldn't be as angry as Cat <laughs> Yeah, and, and I know we kind of touched on this already, but I really want to get your, you know, your, your perspective on this. But I want to know, like, what was it like working with the late, great John Singleton at a young age? Yeah. And then, you know, just starring in that iconic role playing Sweet Pea in the movie Baby Boy. Yeah, and man. Like- Let's talk about it. So it was awesome because I didn't realize how much of a visionary he was and how much of a motivator he was. I didn't know. I just I just wasn't privy to that information. First time meeting John Singleton was on the set of Boys in the Hood. And the same time I met Ice Cube. Mm-hmm. Um, first time I met Ice Cube, uh, I was like, I think I was around, well, let me see. 12, yeah, I was about 12 or 13 years old. Mm. And uh, my brother was filming Boys in the Hood. And my brother was like, yo, meet Q. And I was like, yeah, nice to meet you. And he was terrifying. He was angry. And he just faced me. I was like, does this nigga smile? It's like, there's no cameras rolling. What? Why is he so upset? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it was a brief. He's just, how you doing? Bye. I remember, but I remember his face. And I was just like, that's Ice Cube, all right, you know. And then flash forward, I don't know, 20 some odd years later, I starred in uh, the Barbershop series for Showtime, where I played essentially his role, uh, but for, uh, you know, for Showtime. And that only went one season, um, which I think it was because it was very adult. And Barbershop, the series was very, uh, the movie franchise was very wholesome, you know, maybe PG-13 at best, but this one was like rated N, like it (laughs) it was insane. But anyway, uh, but I met Ice Cube again and he had that same that same look. I was like, that's just his face. Uh, but John Singleton, when I saw John Singleton, when I had, you know, more of a, my first conversation, I should say, um, I just recently posted this and it's fascinating. If you haven't had a chance to see it, go on my page, add Omar Gooding on Instagram, very easy to find and, uh, go back a few posts. And I found the clip that John Singleton saw me in that, that decided for him that I was going to play sweet pea. Now, this clip, um, fresh off of uh, 
smart guy. And this was a fascinating story. I kind of got to tell this story too, because everything wraps, it's just God, everything wraps in together. I auditioned for this movie called Freedom Song. It's about um, the first sit-ins in Mississippi. So I auditioned for this role. Um, quite honestly, I did good. I was always a good auditioner. I mean, I walk into an audition room and other guys go, ah, oh, shit, they can save some roles for us. Like, that's just what it is. I, I knew how to tune everybody out, stay in my zone, then enter the room and kick on another gear, be very personable, be relatable, make these people know that I'm the one you want to work with. We're going to have a good time. And I know my shit. Put the page down. Let's go. It's memorized. I've done my preparation. I'm well prepared. You know, so I killed the audition, um, for lack of a better word. I remember thinking, uh, you know, wait for my agent to call. And uh, they said, nah, they cast somebody else. And I was like, oh, well, it is what it is. So maybe a few weeks later, I get a call from my agent. They say, guess what? Remember that role that they passed on you on? Well, the actor that they cast um, left the project. So they want to know if you're still available and you can come fill in and they'll reshoot the scenes and so forth and so on. And I um, really want to tell the story about how he left, but that's his business. I was just happy that God opened the door. And uh, for me to be in that role, that role, John Singleton saw, gives me a call. And uh, he actually called my mom, who was my manager. And uh, what he told my mom was, I made your oldest son a movie star. I'd like to make your youngest son, son a movie star as well. And then he called me up, told me the story I told you about that he saw me in the movie. And uh, he had a script that he wanted me to read. And I was like, cool, thanks, sir. I'll, I'll read it right now. And when I read that script, it was like, are you serious? Like... For him to not know me at all, um, for there not to be social media or TMZ or anything like that back in the day. So no one knew about my personal life. No one knew that I don't hang around with other celebrities. I hang around with people that I trust and know already. Um, and quite frankly, that I know could fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I go out and something go down, I don't know if Leonardo DiCaprio really got hands. I'm not hanging out with him at the, at the, at the, at the function. You know what I'm saying? I'm going with my partner. And either he got something or we, he got some hands on him. And we gonna, you know what I mean? But yeah. which led to growing up in California and L.A. You know, I was, I was born in Pacoima. I went to North Hollywood High School. I was raised in the Valley. <laughs> That's what L.A. dudes like to call it. You Valley dude. <laughs> but my peoples is from uh, a couple casts well, one one partner's from Compton another one from South Central this and that you know and, and Sundays I'd be out there on the show we you know we do all, you know, all that you know, you know what I'm saying and I'm um, there's places I go for people that are from there and that's, you know so forth and so on so the role itself was easy mm. um, the character was not mm. you understand me I thought it was when I read it uh, when I read it uh, I immediately shaved my head ball, just first off the rip. And uh, then I called John and I said, by the way, do you think he should have like long hair, like cornrows or something or like a bald head? And he immediately said bald. And I was like, good. Because <laughs> uh, else I'm about to grow this shit back. But um, then he said, all right, I'll see you in like three months in my uh, my office in Lemur Park. And uh, we'll audition and see what you got, man. Good luck. You know, because it wasn't an offer. It was a read the script and then I want to see what you got in like three months. Mm -hmm. so, um, three months pass. I lose like 30 pounds. And at 23 years old, it's easy to do. You do this in the weekend. Uh, and uh, when I got to him, you know, I had a tank top on, you know, his head was shaved. And he said, OK, you look the part. Let's see what you got, bro. And we read the scene. Uh, I think it was like two scenes. I can't remember which scenes they were, but we read the two scenes. I just remember energy just raw just raw and i'm growling and what and da, 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 da. do the scenes and he's like thanks for coming in brother good to meet you i said thank you and i left and a month passed mm. <laughs> just let that sit there for a second yeah <laughs> a month passed bro and i'm out in the streets hang on my friends i remember my cell phone rings was well, a cell phone it had to be you know i was at that brick whatever was old school but early 2000 he had cell phones anyway my cell phone rings and I remember answering it and it's my mom. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And she said, hey, you got the part. And I said, what part? <laughs> I said, be specific. 
She says, the movie. John Singleton, the movie. I said, get the hell out of here. It was a month ago. I thought they moved all the fun. Get out of here. So now it's back on, right? So I get to I get to what they have. The first thing he has is a table read. At this table read, um, there were people that had the part and then a couple people that were still kind of auditioning. You know what I mean? So I go through the table read and he says, after the table read, we're going to start rehearsals. So when we started the rehearsals, the rehearsals is your time to add whatever you're going to add to the character. And we did about, I believe, about a week and a half to two weeks of rehearsals where we would do um, improvs and we would talk about the character and then we would, you know, pair up and do scenes work and stuff like that. So we did that for like two or three days. And uh, again, I'm feeling myself, you know, 20 something years old, shaved and doing push ups for three months. You know, I'm feeling right. And, uh, you know, I remember after at the end of one rehearsal, John looks around and he was like, all right, y'all, you know, it's getting there. It's getting there. Y'all are y'all are, y'all are really developing the roles nicely. It's coming along. And then he looks right at me and he goes, well, some of us have to step it up. Mm-hmm. All right. See you all tomorrow. And I was like. Well, what? Did this man just say to me in front of all these people? So I knew that I still had more to do because basically, and then I, you know, I basically went into the, the being Rames thing, which in a nutshell, for the sake of times, I don't know how much time we got. Uh, the next day I was fired up, but I was locked in. You know what I mean? So I was going at everybody. I was making up shit. I was really just fired up. And that led to the physical competition that we had. And then, it, you know, it was all good, blah, blah, blah. People coming up after me like, damn, nigga. Well, where'd you come from? You went to class. I remember specifically being Range said, did you go to acting class overnight? Which is a huge <laughs> thing to say. It's all, it was a compliment on one hand, but all, but also a backhand and other. Like, what the hell did you think of me before? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, you came in here. You were an actor today. Yeah. I don't know what you, before you was like acting like you was a thug or something. That was cute. You know? And then, um, shout out to big cat from sixties crypt. He was there as the kind of advisor dude. Right. And he was just making sure things were authentic. He told me two things. One, stop licking your lips, <laughs> which is interesting. But, uh, chapstick thing. Well, like, hello, cool, Jay. I just lick my lips. But he's like, yeah, no, gangsters don't lick their lips, like ever. And I was like, ever? He's like, yeah, let them, let them be dry. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. And it led to me clenching my teeth when I talk. Just like, you know what I mean? And it, 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 it that also, the clenching, like the talking through my teeth thing was, was what John gave me was also kind of what Big Cat gave me. He was like, Big Cat was like, you're yelling. All this yelling, ah, that's not it. That's not the gangster. The gangster don't do all that yelling. You understand me? And, and what John refined that to is, Omar, you have to internalize it. All that anger, all that stuff that you have, you got to bottle that up so that you want to just explode, but don't. Just keep it in there and lock it in. And then I took a real ride with Big Cat. I go ride and it was dope because he said, all right, you coming with me, man. We're going to hang out. He said, some shit pop off. Don't be no weenie. <laughs> you say something like that to a 24 year old. I was looking for some shit. To pop. <laughs> I was, I was, just, I was zoned out. Right. And then he took me to his hood and we walked around and it was a hood. It was a hood. Man, y'all been in the hood before any hood, them hoods are hoods. And it was one of those things where he was like, you know, it's my hood, but you with me. So you don't have to be afraid in the back of your mind. However, if some shit pop off, don't be no weenie. Those were his exact words. So I was on 10, man, from then on. It was <laughs> it, it was kind of cool because it always I always reminds me of um, Rocky 3 when uh, Rocky loses. And then Apollo takes him and says, yeah, man, you got to get, when I fought you, you had that eye of the tiger. You got to get that. I look at these niggas around here. Look at their eyes. They got that eye of the tiger. That's what you got to get back, Rock. And after about a week of him telling me from he, when he said that, then we went on our ride along, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was kind of dope though, because like I said, I got people that are affiliated in front when I go to their hoods and what's not. And it's just it was like quick. We play some dominoes, eat some barbecue, and I'm out. But it was different then. Going and just walking with him and, and looking and just soaking it in. Not staring at people all weird. I'm doing a documentary. No, no, no. Just, just taking it in. And it got me it got me right in here, you know. And then with John, we're just saying, just bring all of that in. And then I remember the first scene we filmed was the scene in the garage where I say I want to be saved. Mm. 
And before Powerful we scene. film, John, the supreme motivator is, and I told you, and I'm long-winded, but I'm trying to tell you how he motivates. Sometimes he'll tell you something you need to hear, and other times he'll tell you something that you need to hear in front of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And he was like, this is the first scene that I'm sending to Paramount. So it's got to be like that. And he punch you in your chest. He be like, ha, ha. And he did a little laugh. Look now, he's like, so kill it. He says, but I want your heart rate going before I say action. Jump up and down, do jumping jacks, do some push-ups. I want you out of breath by the time I say action. I'm like, say less. So I'm huffing, bum, 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 getting going, boom, 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 boom. And they're like, and sound, speed, quiet on set. Oh, three, two, and action. And I'm, <laughs> no, I'm out of breath already. And I'm pondering, I'm looking down, and I'm in, and I'm, I'm sweepy. You know, I'm not Omar going, oh, John said I got to get this role right. Daddy. I'm not thinking about none of that shit. I'm sweepy, and I'm there. And this is my life if we took a left instead of a right. We didn't end up in Hollywood, but we ended up in a different hood. And you know what I mean? And I went to jail. Or I'm there now, and that's just what I was locked in. People always go, damn, was that hard to like just drop that? Yeah, yeah. You know, they say cut up, still locked in. Not violently, because I'm always a fun, loving dude, but still you're there. And we were there, you know, and it was yeah. that. We were filming the scene where we had to shoot Snoop, and uh, I think the line I said was, what'd you say, or something like that. Uh, which I'm not even sure was was because it didn't make it in the final movie. But I remember there was a specific time where I said, "What did you say?" And was quiet on set, and I heard some dude in the tree said, "I said fuck you, nigga." Like you know what I mean? And these are just people just yelling. You got to block all that out. And I was like, "What he say? Get that!" Nigga. Like you know? And I was like, "Calm down, calm down," <laughs> you know. And then on the flip side, you had Snoop walking out of the trailer with a blunt going here, man. Hit that. And I'm like, "Oh yeah, oh shit, nigga, we are on set," you know. <laughs> so it was it was a lot of that. And I remember he had offered it to you know Tyrese or not Tyrese. I think it was uh, John. John was like, "I don't do that shit," you know. And it was just one of those. It was a lot, no. a lot going on, a lot of moving parts. And like I said, we was there. It was not like you get escorted home, you know. We in the jungles filming. All right, and cut. See y'all tomorrow. Cool. I got to get to my car. I got my peoples. We got to get out there. We got to not get into a fight. I got one dude that with me that's a crip. We in the all-blood neighborhood. Tell him, don't say a word. Don't drive. <laughs> we got to pick it home without shooting nobody or getting shot at. Like, you know, it was real, oh, man. It was real. It's It was amazing to, to see the, you know, the impact of your character because, like, I work with a lot of, uh, youth in the criminal justice system. Yeah. So I, I see your character a lot, you know, just a, a lot of young men who frustrated, you know, trying yeah. to make it out, find a way to do diff- do different things than what you Brother, know they were uh, that, exposed I think to the most were raised on. Im- important part about that role for me was, was seeing how it touched people. I've had grown men come to me in tears saying, that was my life, bro. That's, that is my life that you're telling. And it helps to see that I'm not alone. A lot of people, yeah. you know, I was preaching this big, and I say preaching just like in conversations with, with friends. I even did a song about it called You're Not Alone. Um, during the pandemic, we all thought that this was happening to just us. So yeah. there was some comfort knowing that it was happening to the whole world. A lot of people, sadly, suicides and, and you know, um, depression, they feel like they're being punished or something is just happening to just them and just to know, like, no, this, it ain't just you. <laughs> this is happening to the entire world. And and for a man to be frustrated and want to go out and then do something worse and now they're in the system forever, I think to see that role on screen made them go, oh, shit, I'm not crazy. This isn't, you know, my frustration. And people talk to him like they're crazy. Oh, well, you should have went to jail in the first place. Talk about you can't get a job now. It's like, it ain't that fucking simple either. <laughs> not everybody in jail is guilty you know it's, it's and then on top of that circumstances lead to a lot of situations that just that, that you, you have no choice you know um, and then you, oh, you always have a choice yeah 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 cliche ass I'm just meaning real life and as a man yeah you have this choice and that choice yeah sure you can just go home and stay in your house but we gotta go across the street well if I gotta cross that street I might get into something well I gotta yeah. <laughs> that's no choice you it's gotta learn how to fight, like in, in physically. Your inner man stay prayed up, and physically, because they will test you. Whether you look good or you look bad, you're going to have to know how to fight. Learn that early, early. I always liked to fight. Like that was my problem. I loved to just see what. Let's go, you know. Slap boxing. Come on, that was 
That was a, that was the funnest thing to do in the world. <laughs> they put that no, in the script. It, I'm like, I'm gonna tear this nigga Tyrese up. And that, was, <laughs> that little scene was quick. I'm like, oh, they should put the whole scene in there. I was fucking him up. No, no, but <laughs> but <Yeah>. but <laughs> it's 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 amazing to see though just how that character still stands till t- till today. It's still oh. you know still represents our culture. So it, that that's that's what, I was just see. talking about this yesterday. That movie is now twenty four years old. I went to Arkansas and did some stand up out there. The brother that um, hosted it, which I'm mad I can't think of his name right now, uh, took me to his alma mater. And he, was, he said, you know, this is the HBCU. Are we going to see these kids? And, da, 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 da. and I'm like, these kids ain't going to know me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they lined up to talk about Baby Boy. And I'm like, that movie's older than you. Y'all are what? And they're like, ah, and they're reciting these lines. It's oh, the unstable creature. This is my mama for money. And they're playing out the yeah. scenes with each other. And I'm just like, wow, look at John. Look at God. That's you dope. know BT play it every week now, man. That's true. That's true. That's yeah. true. I was saying that for about 15 years. Like, they play it every day. You know, shout out to yeah. BT. It it <laughs> raise this. But, you know, as I got you here for these last couple, last 10 minutes or so, let, let me get a, the last couple questions out. So yeah. there has been a lot of talking in, uh, in the movie industry, you know, about actors and how much they were paid for their, their debut roles mm-hmm. versus what they may get now. I'm mm-hmm. wondering uh, how much were you paid for the role, baby boy? And do you feel at the time was it was fair compensation or was it more oh, about paid? Are they saying paying? Uh, yeah. I mean, you have to you have, look, you have to earn your quote. Now, um, movies, I haven't done a lot of high profile box office movies so the ones that i have done sure i was getting paid exactly what i was worth Mm. excuse me as a proven movie actor tv shows are different we have a quote every time we test for a film what happens is this you audition after you audition usually with a casting director and then from the casting director um you move on to the producers and then if the producers like you uh you test for it and then when you test for it you uh, negotiate your quote and then you go up against two or three other people and you guys sign contracts, but then you still audition and then they pick who they like based on a, how much they're going to pay you and B how good a job you've done. You know what I mean? Um, And then after you've done a job, they say, yo, my quote has gone up and it just goes up and up and up every time you test, every time you get a new job, so forth and so on. So, you know, with television, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Uh, with movies, uh, as far as my personal worth, I probably, oh shit, I don't think I should be this or that, but I just know the game. You know what I mean? Will Smith, he does those big numbers in the box office. That's why he gets those big checks. Yeah. Uh, would you would you mind sharing how much you would pay for the, uh, the role in Baby Boy? Shit, I comfortable? Mean, to be quite honest with you, I have no idea. Um, it was definitely not a Terrence Howard situation. I saw that interview and that <laughs> floored me. I said, what i got <laughs> oh i got probably i got probably 150 right in there right around 150 because i remember um yeah it was decent and again i just come off a tv show i was well, made three times that you know not per episode but in per per run like you know what i mean so um but yeah 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 i was i was paid right at that i believe it was between you know it was right around a hundred. I say right around. I wasn't just saying too much. It was it was it was it was in the hundred realm. I can't remember for sure. I call my mom right now. She'd be like, ah, uh, eighty-seven thousand two hundred for. <laughs> I got the receipt right here. We're talking about receipts. I got oh no, eighty-seven because I got eight percent. And uh, your manager and lawyer and the blah 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 and all this stuff. Tarazi talk about is true too, man. It's kind of funny too when she said all that. I always remember. I was like, damn, I hate getting paid. Uh, what was the number? I was like, I hate getting paid ten thousand dollars for something because right away it turns into five. And then I give my agent this and that, but then it turns to like three. And then it's like 10,000. It's really like two grand. <laughs> it's frustrating as shit. Well, after you pay every day about it, I'd be like, no, 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 I need more than 10. <laughs> it's how it no matter what it's for, it could be just an appearance or something. Yeah, 15,000 to go, you know, hold something. But I was like, oh, 15 works. But I hate 10. For some reason, I hate the number 10. But it's that type of thinking where you go, damn, it seems like a lot. So you cut it in half and then you take off 30%. Don't have an agent and a lawyer and a and a and a uh, manager. Good grief! All my show run, I was giving ten percent to the agent, fifteen percent to my manager, five percent to my lawyer, and that was before a team who was okay. I got a stylist now, blah blah blah. I got an entourage. I had ten, five dudes living with me. I'm paying rent. This blah blah blah. That money can go quick. Yeah, and you know that's in today's time that's not talked about enough. You know, you know, yeah. help the next generation so they, they don't go through those same struggles. But uh, for these last couple of questions, I'm wondering, uh, you know. What is your message or uh, what message or uh, legacy do you hope to leave behind through your work in the in- in- entertainment industry? 
Um, simply, How do you want to be remembered? That the guy that didn't settle, that mm-hmm. didn't compromise, and that did not let down my fans. Uh, you know, young young actors, actresses, comedians. Com- well, comedians are different because you kind of you kind of got to get in where you fit in. But with actors, you know, it's about roles. And um, I think where a lot of people go wrong is they accept what is given or what is presented and say, well, this is my one shot. I have to do this. It's not true. Um, God has a plan. You have a role coming. You may not start your career to you. Morgan Freeman. I don't know. You may do something <laughs> older in life and then you'd be the old guy. Who knows? Whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know if ah oh, this is my shot, and some people don't. They be like, no, I can't say no. I'm gonna say no. This is my shot. I only get one shot. You only get one shot. And if you do, you wait for that shot, and you'll know when it's right. You know what I mean? I have. I talk about Denzel because I say he's never let me down. He's never let me down. If his name is attached to something, I go, oh, I'm gonna watch this. You know, and I, he's never had a wrong. I go, oh, only stuff that's let me down is the fact that I'd see that he's getting older, and that makes me sad. <laughs> You ain't see a hero because they're like, oh man, <laughs> he's a little slower than he's. Like, That's just a role. They had a great one's hair. He still got it. I'm like, oh, okay, good. Uh, but no, no, no. In all seriousness, um, yeah, man, and and uh, you know, I keep reinventing myself. You know what I mean? Whatever I got to do, you know. And it's not a got to do. I just have a lot in me, you know. And when I first started rapping, I was all over the place because I realized how many things I could do lyrically. I write. I can I can double time. I can I can spit super fast. I can think. I can story tell. I can slow it down. I can um, put it in this pocket. I can put it in that pocket. You know, it was like just pick one, bro. And uh, a lot of rappers would hear me and be like, "You dope." As soon as you figure out exactly what you want to do, you on. And I'm like, "What you talk about? That's what I want to do." I remember there was one rapper that was a uh, Tracy Lee. Remember Tracy Lee? And he could do all these different styles at once. And then it was kind of like a, it was kind of weird. It didn't last that long. You know, people don't want a whole bunch of different things. They just want to know. I'm in the mood for Snoop. Put on some Snoop. Now I want to hear, you know, some Kendrick. Now I want to think about it. You know what I mean? Now, but, you know, you just got to find that pocket that, well, when you say, I want to hear some Omar Gooding, what are you going to get? You're going to get all type of good scatterbrained stuff all over the place? No, no, no. You're going to get something introspective. I'm going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about some curve, And I'm going to snap on whatever beat you give me. You know what I mean? I'm going to be in that pocket. And I'm going to say something. You're going to leave. You're going to listen to that and say, oh, he gave me something. He gave me at least one bar in that beast. And it was on time. And I could, you know what I mean? Um, if you, if, if I invite you out. And I say, I'm going to go on stage and I'm going to grab a mic. You will be entertained, be it rap, be it comedy. If it's comedy and I say, come out to my comedy show, you're going to laugh a lot. <laughs> and if I have an inkling of a, of, a, of a, if I slightly suspect that I'm not enough, I'm going to bring some very funny individuals with me. You will be entertained. If you're watching a movie that says starring Omar Gooding, make sure it's not on Tubi because it may just be a check that I took for one day. <laughs> And uh, if I get one more person to tell me, man, I saw that movie. You died right in the beginning. This isn't starring Omar Gooden. I'm sorry. Some of these cats <laughs> take my picture and put it on the front so you watch the movie. So fact check first. Just DM me. Be like, brother, how long are you in uh, Strange Fruit? I saw that word. Are you in it for long? Are you in it? Are you the man? Are you just in? But there are a couple of movies out there that's all me. Um, and, I'm, and, and I'm, you know, I did have a phase for about five years. People say, man, we haven't seen you in this. Where have you been? I'm like, trust me, I haven't stopped working. If you check my IMDb, people don't know it's basically a digital resume. You look every year, you'll see I've been in something. <laughs> and one, some things are more consuming than others. I was able to kind of lay back and start having kids, which is great when I did family time, because we would film all 13 episodes of a season in a month. So I had 11 months to just be dad, you know, be at home, really do the real family time thing. So I took advantage of that. And then after a while, like I said, people were like, man, we ain't seen you. So I was like, all right, cool. So people kept calling me, come, can you be in this? Can you fly out here? Da, da, da. Sure. So I'll come do the little one-day thing here, there, blah, 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 blah. And then it's like, starring Omar Gooding. I was like, I was only out there for one day. That ain't starring. I'm sorry if I got killed off in the first five minutes. Uh, but anyway, um, but yeah, just, just, just the dude that didn't compromise. Uh, that's, that's just got a lot in his bag, man. I don't want to leave none of these gifts that God gave me behind. You know, so I'm trying to take full advantage. No, I love that. And I feel like that speaks, you know, tons to your character and the type of person you are. And, you know, just speaking on your longevity, you know, I feel like, you know, you're multi-talented, but I feel like that's helped you, you know, just stay relevant for over, well over 25 years now. So yeah, yeah, I, well I, I still don't feel like you've hit your peak. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm excited to still excited to still see you go up and succeed more. So Thanks, you know, I definitely love that. So before my closing question. Yeah. Uh, this podcast is sponsored by Greatness Vodka. They're a local black-owned liquor company here in Wichita, Kansas. Ravens? And on the behalf 
Greatness Vodka. Greatness. Love it. Yes, sir. So on behalf of our sponsors, they would like to know what does greatness represent to you? Uh, greatness is being able to seize the moment at all times, meaning uh, if y'all have a sponsor, I'll be expecting an entire case of that vodka to taste it and make sure it is what it is. Capitalize. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> greatness means <clears throat> being the absolute best that you can be, your best, contributing to whatever uh, craft, whatever field that you're in with something that is great. When I do music, yes. I make sure that at least in my opinion, it's great. Not just, eh, here's something. It's okay, but play this. No, 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 no. It'll be great. I will be great. And I hope that whoever's listening or watching uh, understands that I mean this. I want you to be great because I'm a fan as well as an entertainer. And I love to be entertained as well. And if there's greatness that you just holding on to or keeping secret or keeping in your one little town, please let that out. Please share your greatness with the world. God gave you for a reason. He gave you that gift. Use it. Hey, man, that, that was a beautiful answer, man. Yes, uh, once again, I want to thank you for blessing the platform, taking the time right. out your busy schedule, you know, to give some valuable insights, story and game to our audience. So, yes, you know, for all of our listeners out there, make sure you, you know, stay tuned, subscribe for this upcoming episode. And uh, you have a blessed day, my man. Thank you for you your time too, again. Man. Stay blessed.